Oh, again, good morning, good morning. All the way, <coughs> excuse me, from Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Kruger National Park. Starting off this morning with a little bit of a glitch, but don't let that get you down. We've got a massive show in front of you today. We are going to try and go and live with gorillas today, all the way from Rwanda with Brent. But until that happens, we are coming into this area here close to Sydney's dam because at around about four o'clock this morning I heard lions calling for the first time not to say that they weren't calling from before that to be honest I was sleeping as tight as I have in many a month uh, last night when I surfaced heard these lions calling from this area and I thought we'd crawl into this area and give it a good comb through we're close to Sydney's dam Yesterday we tracked a male and a female mating pair of lions into this area. I thought that they were lying around the dam for most of the day yesterday just because of their distinct lack of animals around this particular pen. But we got here this morning, there's nothing that crosses Voyatella access, so nothing has moved from the dam south today. So now we're on Buffalo's Hook cut line and we are hopefully going to be able to track down at least some furry sharp tooth sharp clawed animal for you today don't forget you are welcome to send through your questions via email or twitter the email you can send to is questions at wild .tv and you can use the twitter handle uh, the hashtag safari live and we will try and get through as many of your comments and questions as we possibly can and you're welcome. You don't have to send a question if you don't know anything uh, about what we're looking at and you, you, you can't think of a question. You're welcome just to send a comment about an experience you had or about, I don't know, anything in particular, even if it's a conversation topic. Let's see where we can get going today. Anyway, it's myself and Jamie out. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Stefan Winterboer. On the camera today, we've got Gert. And we are going to be combing this area in front of us. And while we do that, I'm sure Jamie would love to say good morning to you. I would love to say good morning to you. So good morning to you all and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. My name is Jamie and I have Jandre on camera with me on this chilly winter's morning here in the African bush. And while Steph is scouring the northern boundary for lions, we are scouring the southern boundary for Karula. The Queen of Juma, a female leopard with two little cubs. Now she stashed her cubs somewhere very close to where I live. I mean really very close to where I live. Uh, I think they're somewhere just outside the fence of the house that I stayed in, that I stay in. And I want to see whether or not she has made a return journey from where we last saw her yesterday morning, crossing south out of Juma and into a place called Little Gauri. I'm hoping she might have decided to return to Juma because she definitely crossed out all by herself, leaving her to a five-month-old or nearly six-month-old little bundles of joy waiting patiently for her return. And now we've got to see where they are. I'm keen to see them. It's been at least a week, a bit longer, about ten days since we last saw them and I'm very, very excited to see how much they've grown. And now it's just a question of figuring out exactly where they are and if mom has returned hopefully with news of breakfast for them since it's now been again two days since they've last had a meal it's a tough job being a single leopard mom and Karula has her work cut out for her so what we're doing first we're checking the southern boundary then we're going to struggle to get the car back into reverse once we've succeeded with that then we're going to go back to where she's been keeping her cubs. I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to skip the southern boundary completely. I'm going to take Treehouse Dam Road because that seems to be the path that Karula likes to walk. The difficulty is, of course, is where if she's made a kill, where she's made the kill, and which side of the southern boundary she has made it on. Oh, do -do -do -do. What is this? Now when I'm glancing over the side of the vehicle for our new viewers who are joining us for the first time on this very exciting morning safari experience, I'm looking for her footprints in the sand. Now that's what the sort of constant leaning out over the side of the vehicle is. Right, well, first animal of the day is not a leopard. It is a trotting waterbuck around Treehouse Dam. And I've stopped right here. I know the view is not fantastic, 
But if we go any closer, she's going to run away from us. Hello, girl. With your heart-shaped nose. A little bit jealous of the Waterbuck's fur coat right now. You can imagine that it's nice and cosy under there. Albeit a bit smelly. I wonder if this, there's a calf with her. I wonder if it's the little male that we always see around Treehouse Dam. Let's try and sneak forward. See if we can get a view of the little one. There's legs. There's its legs. <laughs> and one ear. Let's go forward. Oh, well done, Rusty. Rusty's been struggling to start this morning. Which way are you going to go, baby? Okay, just coming through slowly. Hello, little one. Look how fluffy and dark you look. <laughs> All the animals are very much fluffed up right now in the chilly morning air, and this waterbuck calf is no exception. Actually looks almost red in colour. It's not the little male, it's a little female. Hello, girl. <laughs> you look so fluffy. <laughs> giving us a really nice view. First of all, how thick that coat is. And as the name waterbuck implies, it's because they do spend a lot of time in water, when of course there is water. And the little false hooves at the back. And their lovely eyelashes. And of course, that white ring around the bottom. That in theory acts as a follow me sign for mums and calves and groups of waterbuck. That being said, I'm still not entirely convinced that's why waterbuck have white rings around their bottoms. I don't think we fully know exactly why they do. There is a type of waterbuck, not in South Africa, but further north into Africa, that has a solid white bottom. It doesn't have the ring, it just has a solid white bottom. Which I have yet to see, and I'm very excited to one day have the opportunity to see. Alright, little one. We're going to leave you for now. And don't forget, guys, on your live safari experience that you can ask us questions. You can, oh, there's mom coming past. You can send those questions through on hashtag safari live on Twitter, or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv. And please feel free to send through any questions or comments that you might have. We definitely always appreciate hearing from you. And we patiently wait for the rays of the sun to start coming up over the horizon so that we can see our tracks a bit more clearly. We're going to head off towards Treehouse Dam. And while we do, let us send you back over to Steph, find out how his search for lions is going. <coughs> You know, there's an age-old saying that says, red sky in the morning is a shepherd's warning and red sky at night is a shepherd's delight. Have a look at this brilliantly red sunrise. Now, while I don't think it actually is the harbinger of any uh, thunderclouds, which is actually where that saying comes from, um, well, let's hope, well, let's hope it is, but I don't think so. It definitely shows you how much dust and diffusion is in the atmosphere at the moment. Generally speaking, we shouldn't really even be able to be looking at that sun this morning, to be honest with you. Normally, if it was a bright day, it would be absolutely too intense to look at. But you can see that very diffused red glow. Have a look at that. And that, to me, just says that there's a lot of dust in the atmosphere, which is actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Dust in the atmosphere is actually what causes rain, dust and moisture and a bunch of other things, but dust is one of the primary constituents of rain. It allows water molecule to condense around it. 
And that's important for us. But I predict another one of those hazy days. Those days that are almost gray and white. And have that sort of to, the, the, the tone that, that, uh, that is almost uniform in color. That's what I predict today. I think it's going to be quite a warm day. I don't know. So one of the things out here is that because we're so close to the sea, we're only about 100 miles from the seaside where we're standing right now. Because we're in a, in a depression between the Drakensberg mountain ranges and the Lubombo mountain ranges in a place called the Low Felt or the Low, it's a depression. We have weird weather in this little valley of ours that is the Kruger National Park. Even though it's massive, we're looking at say 450 kilometers from north to south and at the skinniest point we're looking at about 80 kilometers wide. We are right on the western side of the Kruger National Park. In that direction there in front of us and down the road much further down the road in actual fact is the eastern boundary of the Kruger National Park and about 80 kilometers from there is the seaside in Mozambique in the Indian Ocean. Now it has been quiet while we were watching the sunrise this morning not a peep from those lions that were busy roaring in this area so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to be making my way out to Bifelsuk Dam. Let's go and check on that lioness with the little cubs. We had a brief visual of her yesterday before she got up and her cubs went into the thicket. And that's what I'm gonna be doing now, I think. I wanna have a little bit of a longer view of her and her cubs, so let's go and see what she's up to. She was looking quite hungry yesterday. She had three of her sisters with her. They were at Bifelsuk Dam, which is a lodestone for a lot of animals. There was, oh, I saw buffalo tracks there yesterday. There was definitely a lot of water buck and zebra around when we got there. And there were a few elephants as well. So I think that's going to be a good place for us to go now. And see what has transpired there over the night. In my mind, I'm busy going over the fact that it's probably going to be endless circles of lion tracks to track and find and bore you with <laughs> before we finally find something that comes out of the bush. But I'm hoping that those lioness teamed up, didn't have to hunt for too long or go too far before they found something last night. And that that mommy lion had some, some food. One of the most, from a metabolic point of view, one of the most difficult things to make is milk in mothers. It takes a lot of energy for an animal to turn what they're eating into milk. And for that reason, she's going to try and wean these little cubs off of milk as quickly as she can. They start eating meat at about eight weeks. So not too long from now, they're going to be starting to eat meat. She won't bring meat back to the den. Generally what happens at about eight weeks, she'll start taking her cubs from the den to kills, where they'll start to nibble a little bit and have, have some meat from about eight weeks. And they're fully weaned at about six months only. All depending on what happens but with it being the end of the deep part of the dry season at the moment I predict that there won't be a shortage of food for these for these lion if anything I think they're just going to get healthier it's still quite cold this morning, I mean, I say it's still quite cold with no hat on my bald head and my hands with no gloves on and my shorts <coughs> on, my, on my legs. There's a grey daker in the road in front of us. I tell you, these things are so difficult to get into camera view. Let's see if we can sneak up on him. They hardly ever sit still. I'm sure this little guy... There he is on the other side of this drainage line. Let's see if we can sneak forward. There he is there. Characteristic trot that they've got with that black stripe on the end of the tail and then Dekka. Exactly where they get their name from. Dekka is the Afrikaans word for diver. So it's in reference to the fact that whenever they see a person or whenever they see anything, they're always diving into the thickets, into the thick bush. <laughs> Tough to actually get a, a handle on them some days. 
Very little is actually known about those little antelope. We get three of the five dwarf antelope that occur in South Africa here. The Steenbok, which is a, a familiar site. The Daker, which is also familiar. Some of the rockier areas of the Sabi Sands. There's a few rockier places where these granite tops stick out of the Sabi Sands. Uh, in the middle of the Sabi Sands, on the western side of the Sabi Sands, there's this ridge of rock that come in. And then right in the south of the Sabi Sands, there's a little bit of rocky area as well. And quite often, the Clipspringer can be seen on top of those rocks in those areas. Right, now you might notice that my head is on a little bit of a swivel. <laughs> Jen Lee has just asked me if any of the animals suffer from constipation because of all the dry leaves and grasses that they eat. Uh, Jen Lee, I would almost go so far as to say that animals are in a constant, the ruminants are in a constant state of chronic constipation or acute con constipation and I'll show you where I'm, why I make my prediction on that in a second. Uh, animals have the ability to take as much moisture as they possibly can out of the food that they eat and out of their intestine. And what that does is it creates a, uh, a drying effect and that then comes together and basically gives them what we would call constipation but for them is actually 100% normal and what I'm going to try and find for you, there's a kudu in the road in front of us she's just walked across there's more in the road and switch off, that silhouette is just absolutely beautiful, just a left a bit cut onto the road, there we go and there's another one coming onto the road now Get ready with your screenshots as it's silhouetted. It's a beautiful shot. Look at that. Oh, lovely. And the young male. Here we go. Some nice photos for you this morning. Kudu's silhouetted against the thing. I'm just blowing my fingers. They've gone all stiff and cold. <laughs> <laughs> only 50 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment, it's actually not that freezing. But with a wind chill on top of your steering wheel, it can actually get a bit cold. So uh, Jen, just to get back to your, just to get back to the answer of your question, I'm, I'm trying to find a midden, an impala midden, to actually show you what I'm talking about. And as soon as I find one, I'll show it to you so that you can see why I say that animals are in a constant sort of salt constant constipation state Let's go forward a little bit these kudu are making their way down this little alley here we've got lions roaring that's what they're listening to So two lions roaring at least. Wow. All right, now what I need to do is now you're going to be privy to a little bit of game ranger tactics here. We're going to have to call that in on the radio. And the reason being is that it's actually quite difficult to listen to lions roaring when you've, when you've got the vehicle's engine on. And so what I'm going to do is just update everybody on the radio to the fact that I've just heard lions roaring and where I think they're roaring from. And I do that so that they can not just switch their cars off, the lions have stopped roaring now, but to start get a picture about where these lions are and to make a concerted effort to try and find them. So this is what I'm using. I'm using one of these radios. The stations, I just had the audio of two male lion calling. It sounded like a south of Voyatella Dam at the junction with Central and Gary Main, somewhere around there. Uh, it could also be on Twin Dams Road, somewhere around T Twin Dams Junction with uh, 
Chile Pan just on the northern side of that. So that's my prediction as to where I think those lions are, are, are calling. And um, Jamie has just spoken into my ear there. I don't know if you noticed the slightly cross-eyed look that I get there and somebody talks into my head while I'm trying to speak to you. <laughs> but Jamie has just said that she's on Twin Dams Road. She's going to be making her way up Twin Dams Road to see if she can find it. All right, and that sort of has changed our plans a little bit because we now know that those lions have been roaring and um, we can go and have a... A look at what's going on over there. You just answer the radio again. Oh, that's affirmative. That's affirmative. All right. So now, because because I called in the uh, the sighting, everyone is asking me for updates um, on where I particularly heard those sight that 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 roaring from. And it's only we're lucky. We had lucky heard those could you switch off the car and get to hear, hear them. But Jamie is on Twin Dams and I'm sure she's going to be able to give you a bit more of an update about where she is and what she's about to do. It is with deep regret that I find myself upon Twin Dams Road. Not deep regret, that's probably a slight exaggeration. But this is, the, this is definitely the coldest road on Juma because it runs right parallel to the only major river system, I say major river system, slightly major river system on Juma, which means because it's the lowest lying in terms of altitude, it's the lowest lying point, it's really cold. It is really very, very cold. But it's a good place to start looking for those lions that Steph heard roaring. I didn't hear them roaring because we were driving along. And it's also a good place to check for Karula tracks coming back towards where she has stashed her cubs. I've got birds calling, go away birds alarm calling just in front of us. And I just want to double check carefully. There's hyena tracks everywhere as they always are. They come through during the night and taunt us with the fact that they have moved their den site away from where we can go and find them. But their tracks are still here, so they're still around and about each and every single night. Okay, lions, we hear you. Well, we know you're here somewhere. It's just a matter of figuring out exactly where they are and also really hoping that they're not in the dip we call the Mulwati drainage line because it's very cold in there. Let's speed things up a little bit. Let's see if we can't find those male lions. What is that? <laughs> it's playing hard to get. Steph tried to sneak up on a daker. We've um, done a slightly... No, we haven't done any better of a job. There was a daker there. You can just see it moving at the back. You look really carefully. Well done, Chandra. Very difficult to get Dacre on screen. And they like to dash off almost immediately. Okay. So Steph said it was somewhere north of Chele Pan. So this is Chele Pan that we're coming up to now. Where in summer the buffalo frolic in the muddy water. In winter it is just a dried up mud wallow and in fact you know I don't think we ever collected the Easter egg that we hid in that tree <laughs> that I hid in that tree come to think of it we had an Easter egg hunt and um, I think perhaps in that leadwood tree there is still an Easter egg hiding out <laughs> I might go and look for that at some point I wonder if anybody ever collected it I think I went on leave straight after that Oh well. Don't worry, they were just eggs. So they're not going to pose any kind of risk to any of the animals out here. Okay. Alright, now things walked along Twin Dams Road this last night, except for hyena and mongoose. Okay, here's the coldest part. 
forgot my hot water bottle this morning, which I'm deeply regretting. morning to Tiffany and many of you will know Tiffany she is Sinead's sister Tiffany it's wonderful to have you watching our safari and yes I will try really really hard to find you a giraffe you're right we haven't seen that many giraffe recently I don't know where they've all gone maybe they are I don't know maybe they've gone to see if there's some better food towards the rivers where there's a bit more water but honestly, I don't know where all of our giraffe has gone. I feel, it feels like a really long time since I last saw a giraffe. I will look very hard to see if we can't find them. And Tiffany's also super excited about the gorillas, as am I. I really, really cannot wait. I'm going to be racing after the end of the sunrise safari to go to final control to see if we can watch them from there. I think everybody's feeling incredibly excited about this. Tiffany, I'll make sure I look out for giraffe for you. And Linda, yes, as far as I know, yes, that's going to be the plan. Brent is going to be on foot with the gorillas. There's a question through from Linda Wise. Uh, I'm a little bit jealous of this opportunity, but I'm also mainly just incredibly excited for him. I think it's going to be a fantastic experience and I can guarantee that Brent's also going to be looking at each and every single bird species that he can find and add to his list. And he, one of our viewers actually asked yesterday if it was cheating to add the birds to their bird list and I said absolutely not. You're not going to have, well, you never know, but for now this is going to be a once-off opportunity to add birds from Rwanda to your bird list. You might as well make the most of it. It'll be interesting though because Graham will be Brent's cameraman so it'll be interesting to see if he is going to be prepared to zoom in on all the different bird species. Woo! Okay, there's no lions on this road. That's much I can tell you. There's no tracks. So they haven't walked here yet. Unless they're further up towards the pan. Might even be heading to that spot for a drink. While we come through here, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, these are old. These are from yesterday. There are lion tracks here, but these are from the lion that Steph had on the sunrise safari yesterday, making his way south. And the reason I say that is because they've already been driven over. No, none of the vehicles, except for me, have come along this road just yet. Right, while we're here, this is the, my, the house that I live in is probably about 300 yards into the bush there. And that is where the last tracks of Karula's cubs disappeared into the bush. She went in with them and she came out on her own. So somewhere in here are little leopard cubs hiding out waiting for mom to come and fetch them. And they will start getting braver, so it's worth coming through really slowly here. 
because they're going to start ranging a bit further afield. They're not staying right in the bush that mom put them in. They will start exploring their world a little bit. These birds would tell us. With their sharp eyes, these birds would give us the first indication that something had wandered past. We've got some go-away birds that are doing exactly what I want to do, which is find a spot in the sun. Sunbathe a little bit. They're also looking puffed up and a bit chilly. Also gives me an opportunity to just sit and listen for a moment. Sure that these lions are somewhere here. Okay. So while we look about for any sign of the lions or Karula's cubs, Michael, you wanted to know how old the cubs would have to be before they could survive on their own without their mother in case something did happen to Karula. And the answer is they'll usually, it will be at around a year and a half probably that they would be capable of surviving. A year, possibly, a year old leopard cub is capable of making small kills and they do at around that age to practice. So that's a possibility. Shh, sorry. I just heard a soft line, ooh. But now all I hear is a woodpecker. I'm going to put my earpiece back in. I'm trying to show you a moth. Hold on one moment. I'm going to try and scoop it up because it's an amazing looking moth. Come on, buddy. There we go. My freezing red, bright red fingers. Look at this moth. Now, have you ever seen something so perfectly designed for hiding in trees? And actually, it's got this fine scaling stuff that's come off of my finger as it brushed past. So that scales from this moth's feather. Oh, sorry, not feathers. They don't have feathers. They have wings. But, I mean, this moth, if you put it on a tree with a bit of lichen... It would absolutely be perfectly camouflaged. I have no idea what it is. It's one of those amazing little creatures. There's so many different types of moth species that this one is a mystery. I'm trying to get a hint as to what it might be. I know some of you are really good at finding out what different moths are. So if you could figure out what this may be and send those answers through to me on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email them through to questions at wildearth.tv. I'd love to hear about it. I'm very curious. I, I could check in my insect book, which I think I have with me, but I doubt somehow it's going to be in there. So if we go forward a little bit, try and do this one-handed. So if we have a look at the lichen on this, or the peeling bark actually as well, lichen plus peeling bark, on this guari bush. Now, this little moth might want to ride along with us, but it's not a very good place for it to be. So I'm going to pop it back on there as a perfect spot for it to be entirely camouflaged. Let's see if we can't get it on here. There you go, buddy. Come on. Yes, no? Don't want to hurt him. There we go. How does that look? Can you see him there, Jardre? Yeah. Now, not quite. He needs a lighter color lichen. But that will do for now as a hiding hole for our little mystery moth. That's opportunity to just have a look at tracks in the sand. Cool. From here I can't see him at all. 
a, a perfect little hiding spot. No calls of those lions again. I think they might be on a mission to try and get somewhere else. Okay. Bye bye, moth. I can actually just see it poking out over the top of the bark there. Well, we continue our search for these male lions, and I've got some Inyala walking in front of me here that I think would have alarm called if they had been on this road. So I'm going to expand my search slightly further afield. I just want to check around this block for any sign of Karula coming out first. While I do, let's go back across to Steph and find out how his morning is going. And you caught us just in about to approach Bifuso Dam. I don't quite know what we're going to be finding over here. The lionesses are not at the den and so we did make a turn through there. Didn't see any lionesses, didn't find any fresh tracks in the area and have moved out. So they're still hunting somewhere. So they're either lying on a kill somewhere or they're still out hunting or making their way back to this particular area. I haven't seen any tracks crossing north towards Biffles Hook. And so I still think that they're somewhere around here, probably between here and where we heard those male lions roaring. Uh, nothing here, which doesn't surprise me with a lioness, literally with cubs right here. She'd come down to this water quite often, I think. What I'm looking for is any fresh sign. There's a big game path two of them actually that come out of this block and quite often you'll find that lions will use those game paths sorry Rebecca you're just gonna have to go with that question again I didn't quite catch the beginning of it Ah, so Ellie, all the way from Indiana, and good morning to you, Ellie, it's still evening for you there. You've asked me, wouldn't roaring um, chase animals away, basically, so it would make it difficult to hunt? Um, that was a gray heron that you were having a look at over there, by the way, just before I answer that question. Ellie, not really. I, I've seen animals listen to roars, just similar to how those kudu were, were doing when we were listening to the roar and watching them react to it and they, they only really react when it's close to them um, and then they move off only a little bit they tend to be like we are we quite dismissive if we can't actually see the lion it's funny that how it, how it works like that so no not really doesn't hurt their chances whatsoever I think they're a little bit more cautious but nothing much else Oh, that hippo is not here. I did see his fresh tracks. He probably will come back at some part, at some time this morning. I think these poor hippos in this particular area are needing to feed so for so much time during the during the evenings to get enough grass to fill their big bodies. I think they take their time getting back here, and with it not being that hot, with it not being that warm until probably nine or ten o'clock, I think they can actually afford to stay out much longer there than they otherwise would so not much going on over here all right let's have a look at that gray heron again he seems to be in residence here at the moment mainly fishing for frogs amphibians arthropods it's any sort of insect that lives in the mud any fish that happened to have survived the drying up the first drying up of this pan which happened a couple of months ago and then we had some rain which filled it up now it's fast drying and quite it's difficult to predict exactly how much how long this water will last to be quite honest because we don't know the rate of evaporation with these cooler days but i'm sure that for that entire time this gray heron is having he's going to have 
a feast here. This, this water will definitely be attracting some forms of life that's, uh, that, that's on the menu of this particular bird. Quite a large bird. You're looking at it standing as an adult. If you were to stand up, it would probably standing up tall reach to your hip. And is not uncommonly found wading sort of leg deep into the mud to go and uh, catch whatever's going about. That little bird that you see tinkering about in front of it, that's a three-banded Corsa. Let me have a look and see, just confirm it for you with my binoculars before I stick. Yeah, three-banded Corsa. Also a bird that eats insects on the muddy fringes and is associated with these pans. Three-banded plover. Not coarser, excuse me. Three-banded plover. Dead quiet around here at the moment. I haven't heard any other reports of anyone else hearing those lions roaring. It definitely sounded like they were on our property, I must be honest. Well, on the property that we traverse. For those of you who are, we've got a great diker that's just come out of the out of the leaves and then straight back into it again. Have a look over there, right at the end of there we go. Well done, Ghat. Characteristic black stripe down its tail. And then that's just habits of just disappearing or diving into the bush as soon as it can. All right, I think let's carry on going. Oh, hang on, wait, that, that heron is wading. Just to put uh, proof to my point. Got this funny noise happening in the bushes off to my right hand side where that daker dived into. I'm just trying to figure out exactly what it is. I think it's an alarm call actually. It's so difficult actually getting an idea of where these sounds are coming from. Excuse me, having to cup my ear. What it does is it gives me a bit of a kudu ear. I'll show you how to do it. You take your hands and you make two cups like this and then you cup your ears it doesn't look very clever or very smart, I must be honest, but you cup your ears. And what it does is it actually amplifies sound coming from any particular area. You can try it in your house or where you're sitting at the moment. Cup your ear and try and listen to a conversation across your office or cup your ear and try and Listen to something that's far away and then cup your ear like that, like I was doing, and you'll see what a dramatic difference it actually makes. Sun reflected off of the water is actually quite pretty. That's a blacksmith lapwing. Just hunting the water's edge here. Michael, who's 18 and watching the show all the way from the US. Uh, hi, Michael. You just asked me if uh, the grey heron is related to your great blue heron. Uh, are they the same bird or are they just related? I would say that they're probably not the same bird um, and that they are related. You'd find that herons across the world would share some similarities, um, but there'd be differences. They'd share similar ways of wading. They might even be similar sizes but their colorations will be slightly different. I remember when I traveled through the US on a bit of a birding trip, I saw many birds, even, even skimmers, which I only thought occurred in Africa, but when I looked closer, their coloration was slightly different. And the gentleman I was traveling with absolutely confirmed to me, and he's an African wilderness expert as well, 
confirm to me that while they may look the same, while they may even behave the same, they're definitely different birds with different habitats and behaviors. So I would say, without knowing your great blue heron at all, I would say that it's probably a similar type of bird exhibiting a similar type of behavior, but isn't the same species. All right, I think let's move on from here. Let's see if we can try and pick up any of these cats around here. Loda wanted to know what my, fav my favorite safari bird is. Um, <laughs> that's a tough one. I think it changes with my moods, to be quite honest with you. I quite enjoy the parrots. Any bird that's really animated, I quite enjoy. Watching a hummercock fish by moving his leg in and out of mud is quite comical. I enjoy watching the woodpeckers and I suppose a whole bunch of different birds. It's definitely mood related with me, to be quite honest. Mood and daytime. Depends on how I feel. All right, now we've got this very fine talcum-like dust here. And it is very good for holding tracks. Now what I'm going to do, absolutely going to see where these tracks of these lioness come and go from. I'm busy looking at the game paths all around the dam and what I'm expecting to see at some point is tracks of these female lioness. When we left them there were four of them and that was including the mother of the cubs that is in this area and that is a formidable hunting force. The Nkuhuma sisters all back, very experienced at hunting buffalo. Nice to know that those elephant that were in this area seem to have moved off. When we left the cubs last night, there was a herd of elephant that was right there, literally by them. I was a bit worried. Elephant can be a bit edgy around lion cubs. And while I have never seen elephant kill cubs myself, it's not uncommon to hear of cubs going missing after elephant have been in the area. Okay, here we've got some lion tracks. of all of the sisters. They come out here and they cross through this block. Let me show you. Let me show you the fresh tracks of these lines. Before I jump out, it's always a good idea to have a look at what goes on. But here's a track here. That's one. That's the second sister. Here's the third. So we've got three lioness here. So just three. And here's a fourth one here. Four lioness. So we've got them walking next to one another slightly. Here's one, two, three, and four. All of them together, going off in this direction, which is not quite where we heard those male lions roaring. We heard those male lions roaring there. These lionesses' tracks head off in this direction. They might be joining up with one another, but at least it's given us a direction where we need to start looking. All right, which is good. So, time to turn around because this road goes in exactly the opposite direction to those tracks. All right, and I think while we're busy turning around and deciphering this trail, let me go back to Jamie and you can get an update on what she's been up to. Uh, Steph is several steps ahead of me this morning. He's got a trail to decipher. I haven't got any trails to decipher. It doesn't look as though Karula's come back towards those cubs, but it's impossible to tell because of the area that she's put them in. There's so much vehicle traffic that I have no doubt that I could have missed a track going in. I don't think so. I've checked really carefully, but I can't, and I can't find any sign of them going out again. 
but it's so tricky to tell just in terms of the constant vehicle traffic that goes around that particular area. And we're going to expand our search further afield and stop, find a patch of sun and have a look at these Impala because I'm cold and I feel as though it, some sunbathing time might be quite nice. There we go. Ooh, this is very nice. Before we get to Icicle Dip, used to be known as Philemon's Dip, it's now known as Icicle Dip. And just like our water buck from earlier, fluffed up and deep red from the cold. And the nice thing is now that the rutting season has passed, we're seeing more and more of these mixed herds. The, the males are still getting confused every now and again. Listening to the alarm call of the go away bird, but it's not serious. But yes, you've got mixed herds of males and young, your know, young males and females. Look how much our little ones from the start of the year or the end of last year have grown with their now little dagger like horns. What have you seen, Impala? Nothing too interesting. Much more occupied with nibbling away at the strychnos or the monkey orange. There's one impala looking off into the distance. I wonder what she has seen. It's not it's nothing that is distressing her too much. She was just double checking to make sure all was okay there. And now after the rutting season, each almost every single female that we watch is pregnant. Only still in early stages, but they will be starting to look enormous before we get to the start of the rainy season. Before they give birth at the end of November, beginning of December. And that's something that all of us always look forward to. It's such a beautiful time with little impala lambs leaping about and playing around. Here's the big male. One of the big males. As I said, the groups are starting to mix now. With those dark metatarsal glands on the back of his legs. And those dark patches of fur on his back legs hide a gland that releases pheromones, but nobody actually knows exactly what it's for. One theory is that they release... Uh, they release scent from those glands when they're being chased, when their adrenaline goes up and they become stressed. And what it does is it sort of acts to keep the herd running together. I think it probably serves a, that purpose or potentially even more just to do with the natural hormonal cycle of the animals. He's looking in good condition. And still the little male's a bit nervous of him with his fully grown horns. There's another male. So what we were talking about before, starting to mix things up a bit. They still, every now and again, when an impala ram's, ram runs past another impala ram, they get jumpy, waiting to see if that impala ram is going to start a fight with them or not. Okay. Well, they...
scratching away on an acacia tree. All right, all seems well. In that case, I shall pass on my apologies. We're very sorry something went wrong, but we seem to be up and running once again and hopefully back in sync with the stream that's going out. My Obviously, my mouth was moving, but the sounds were coming out about eight seconds delayed, but we seem to be sorted out now, so we do apologize. Just a quick update. When we get signal from the guys in Rwanda, then we will go live. You know it's from the middle of a rainforest, essentially, so that might take them some time to get up and running. But as soon as they are up and running, then we will go live with them and their expedition into the mountains to find some gorillas for you. Oh, that still feels a bit weird to say. It's going to be very strange linking to gorillas. But for now, we've got a very peaceful sighting of our elephant bulls. And I'm sorry, I need to sneeze, but it's stuck. They're peacefully eating away. I wonder if this is Asbo, the elephant I've nicknamed, the antisocial behavioral order. Because during, not last night, but the night before, an elephant broke into the main camp, the DRC, pushed over a very large tree onto the bathroom roof, narrowly avoiding pushing it over onto several people's vehicles. And I sometimes wonder, I think the elephants are smart enough to work out where they should push a tree over and where they shouldn't. Now we had a very lucky, some vehicles had a very, very lucky escape in that sense. And then one of them came and kept me up until 2 o'clock in the morning, munching outside my window. Which was beautiful, but I was then thoroughly exhausted by the end of it. Shame. The poor elephants are struggling for food at the moment, trying to get to wherever they can, and I think the prospect of a leafy green tree inside a fenced area just proved to be far too attractive for them to stay away from. I don't think this is the gentleman that was in the garden with me. The one that was that I was chatting to until two o'clock in the morning had a slightly shorter tusk. This guy's got a bit longer tusks. There's just something so phenomenally peaceful about spending time with elephants. As they nibble away, he's thoroughly enjoying that acacia tree with its sweet bark. You can hear the Koki Franklin. Koki, koki. Making a great deal of noise. Jonah, did you hear, hear a weird sound from in there? Oh, is it an Ellie? Okay, it might be the rest of There might be a herd, and these boys are just trailing them. I heard it, but I've got my earpiece in, so I couldn't quite work out exactly what the sound was. And elephants do make some very peculiar sounds. There's the other bull at the back. He might actually be my friend from the other night. I say my friend, he won't, would not ever recognize me. Well, from our beautiful big elephant bulls, it seems as though Steph has also had some elephant luck. Let's head across to him and have a look at a tiny little elephant. Welcome back. Yes, absolutely. We've got this elephant here, this female elephant without the tip of her trunk. She's well known to us. And she had, does have a tiny little baby elephant with her. I'll show you him now. She's just digging for roots at the base of this combretum. And she was using her foot. And that's what that dust cloud is in front of her face. And she's using her foot with great dexterity because she doesn't have the tips of her trunk, the fingers. There she's blowing. Isn't that amazing? There she's lifting up. You can see not having the tip of her trunk she isn't doing too much there she's gonna looks like she's gonna use her toenails and her toes again there you go holding it a little bit clumsy using her foot there to great use I think she's probably learned how to use her foot much more than other elephants would because she doesn't have those two fingers on the end of her trunk you don't know, like we've remarked on so many occasions, it doesn't seem to have had a detrimental effect on this particular elephant at all. Her calf, 
is still in good condition. She's still in good condition. Have a look at her chewing that root. Now, quite often we find elephants chewing roots. And I know from studies that I've done with plants that most of the, the minerals and the nutrients are found in the root and the root bark of trees. Probably about 8 out of every 10 medicinal uses of plants out here is the roots of a tree. Contrary to popular belief, not the leaves and not the fruits in most cases. There she's now just shifting those bushes out the way. Looks like she's hasn't quite finished. Hasn't quite finished with this particular tree yet. Using her toenails and her heel. There you go. It's not very often we get to see elephants doing this this relaxed. She's incredibly relaxed with the vehicle. We're no more than 10 yards away from her at the moment. Crunching, crunching away at those leaves and the roots. Her eyes are angled down. She's actually looking at her feet right now. So most of their vision is centered around the tip of their trunk and their feet. They actually have to lift their head up to see us. She can. She absolutely knows we're here. We're in a. You know, we're in a seven thousand pound car. Actually, not that much. Probably a four thousand pound car with two men on the back. Not having any any reaction to us, which is exactly how we like it. Using her heel again to loosen up that trunk. There she goes. Amazing the power that she's got in that trunk, eh? There's a bit of speculation as to how she. Yeah. Mercedes has just asked me a question about um, how do elephants sleep and what do they do at night? Mercedes, they absolutely do sleep. They sleep on their sides like we do. So they sleep right flat against their, on their sides with their head down, fast asleep. They look almost unconscious. And they will sleep a couple of hours a night. It's seasonal, it's seasonal, so in summertime they'll sleep a lot longer than they do in winter time, simply because in winter they need to eat much more food to get the nutrition that they need to stay healthy. So she will sleep a couple of, couple of hours a day, usually in winter time that is taken in short snippets between bouts of feeding. That rumble that you heard, that's a contact rumble. That sound, that very deep sound is made in the frontal part of her, of her head where you Just amazing the way that she's using her feet there. She's just getting the sand out of the way. Getting the brush out of the way now. Megan, all the way from Ottawa, good evening Megan, you just asked a nice question 
and how difficult is it to actually dig there? If I were to 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 dig there, how easy would it be? Megan, it's difficult to be honest with you. We wouldn't be able to do it with our fingers and our feet. We would definitely need an implement like a pick or a spade. Um, a, we'd, we'd really easily, with a pick and a spade, dig like she's digging, but definitely not with our fingernails and our and our feet like she is. It, it'll take some considerable effort. Those roots, for instance, that she's just quite easily plucking out of the ground, you won't be able to pull broken with your hands and your strength. The thinner ones maybe, but like the one that she's eating there right now, there's no way that I could have broken that with my own strength as a single person here. I would have needed a tool. She looks like she's really enjoying that root. You can almost see this look of contentment on her face. <laughs> I don't know if she's gingerly chewing it or not. So Karen, you've asked us from New York, um, what is the tip of her trunk? Uh, what's it from? Is it from a birth defect or from an injury of some sort? Karen, I'd, I'd most likely say that it's an injury of some sort. Um, she's either burnt it or it was bitten off in a fight, which quite often happens. Um, she could have lost it as a youngster to hyena or to lion. It doesn't look like a birth defect. It's a bit... There looks like some scar tissue that's at the end of that, of that trunk. It just looks a bit raw for a birth defect. It's not to say that elephants don't get birth defects. They absolutely do. But in this particular case, I think, and it's also not even. It seems to be a little bit higher up the trunk on the, on the right-hand side of the trunk than on the left-hand side of the trunk. Let's see what you think. To me, it just looks like there's a bit of scar tissue there. And that it happened a long time ago. She's incredibly good with her trunk the way it is. I don't think it's a recent injury. I think that this probably happened as a calf. Elephant do bite one another. And you sometimes see elephant just missing tails and chunks out of their trunks. It's absolutely them biting one another. They also get preyed upon by a lion and by hyena. And as a youngster, she may have fallen victim to a lion or a hyena. It could also even be something like a crocodile. Having grabbed her on the end of the trunk and created such a bad wound that by the time it healed itself, she had lost the use of the tip or lost the tip of her trunk, not just the use. There's also a good chance it may have been a snare. I don't know where she's from. But it's not uncommon to find snares, wire snares in the bush here from time to time. She may have been feeding like she is now and caught the tip of her trunk in a, in a snare. And then in her efforts to try and release herself, that snare then cut into her trunk and chopped off the end of it. But I must be honest, you know, while I pity her... You know, I, I don't, I don't have another feeling that comes across when I, when I look at her. To be honest with you, she's actually okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with her, with her ability to look after herself and look after her baby. In actual fact, so, in other words, it's a disability that's had no noticeable effect on what she is. That's her baby that you're looking at over there. I don't quite know if it's a male or female. I think it's a young female. Oh, Rene, you've just asked me a nice question. Is she smaller than normal? You've noticed that she's standing almost eye level to the vehicle that we're at. She's not a full-grown female elephant, Rene. You're quite correct. Uh, she's a youngster. I don't think that it's her first baby. I would say that she's probably in her 20s, this elephant. Somewhere between 20 and 30 is where I judge what she is. She's... I'm sitting on the back of a Land Rover, and she is below eye level with me. Her, her head height at the moment is, is on par with me in a Land Rover. So 
I am six foot tall and I'm probably sitting at about six foot, just below six foot, five foot eight, five foot nine. That's what her head is at the moment. And I think even if she had to pick her head up to full stretch, I probably she'd just be taller than me just a little bit. So there she goes. She just wrapped that root around her trunk like you would around, a string around your arm and just pulled it out of the ground. I would have had to have strained against that root with probably all of my weight to get that right. Look at how she's bending her head down. And she's going to kick it. No. Using the sideways sweep of her foot to get that out. How interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, man, now all of a sudden. I just, I'll put that down to her having some dust in her trunk that she wanted to get out. She wasn't telling us anything. If we were upsetting her, she would have let us know a long time ago. I think she was just sneezing and shaking the dust out of her head. So no, just to finish off that comment, not, not, not a very big female. So Sara, you've just made an interesting comment that you read somewhere or you've heard from someone that elephants are left or right tusked. And you'd like me to expand on that. Now, they absolutely are, uh, Sara. Elephant have got what they call a slave tusk, which will be a tusk that they have learned to use over the other one. They have, they have a hemisphere, they have hemisphere preference, similar to what we do. And they will have, out of their two tusks, one tusk will be noticeably more used than the other. With some elephant, not all elephant, with some elephant. And that's called the slave tusk, and that elephant will either be left or right dominated on that tusk. But far more importantly, every elephant definitely is left or right sided with their tusk. When an elephant, for instance, has a, has a grass or a piece of stick, and they do that with their trunk, they will all the, either always go this way around, or that way around. So they'll either approach it this way around, or that way around, and that is individual, that is for every single elephant, has an either a right twist, or a left twist to their trunk when they're picking up grass. So you're absolutely right. Your observation there or what you heard there is not wrong. They do exhibit a slave tusk behavior. Some elephant, not all elephants, some elephant have perfectly symmetrical tusks. But what every elephant does have is either a lefting twist or a righting twist when they're busy feeding on grass. Let's see. We won't be able to see it with this elephant because she doesn't have the fingers to her trunk. She may show us. She's now standing in an absolutely a wrong one for us to see that. But good, good observation there, Sarah. <laughs> Dawn, welcome to Safari Live. You're a first time viewer and you've just made a comment saying that you love seeing baby elephants. Well, welcome to Safari Live, Dawn. And yes, Comments like that are awesome. I'm actually going to try and move the car a little bit. So, I'm going to see if I can get us into a position where we can see the baby a bit better. There you go. <clears throat> baby elephant, copy what the rest of the elephants in the herd do. Like, you can't believe. They're like little copy cats, and even though this young elephant is still nursing from his mom he has already started to foray into the vegetables into his greens and what will be interesting to learn about this little elephant is if this little elephant in copying his mother's feeding style in other words using her feet more than her trunk if he will have a, an, an advantage over his peers in years to come because she's teaching him how to live by using her feet more than her, her trunk. Whereas he's going to have the benefit of choosing which one he wants to use in whatever application. You can see that trunk is still a little bit floppy. It takes them almost six months to learn how to use their trunk properly. Oh. 
I just find elephants so fascinating to watch, to be honest with you. Ah, good question, Richard, all the way out from Houston. You've asked me if they sleep on their sides and they sleep, how do they protect their babies? Richard, every herd member here is responsible for the safety of every other member in that herd. And so, although the babies, babies generally sleep with moms looking over them, they don't sleep at the same time. But if it would happen that a mom and a baby had to fall asleep at the same time, there will be some members of that herd who are not sleeping. And so it's only really the single bulls, the large bulls, who sleep solitarily. They don't have anyone standing guard over them, but they really don't have anyone to, or anything to worry about. But these female elephants that do have lion to worry about, that do have hyena to worry about, when they corral themselves in the evenings, in some shade or on the side of a termite mound, not all of them will sleep at the same time. That's the first safety measure. And the second safety measure is that every herd member has a responsibility towards the collective safety of the herd. They will all stand guard, or the ones that are awake. And when they get tired and fall asleep, then their friends will wake up. Act as centuries, basically. I love the way these baby elephants fold their ears over their backs. Because they're still so young, they don't quite know how to use their ears just yet. Have a look. <laughs> He's putting some pressure on his trunk so his back legs are, are lifting up in the air. And now I've laughed at her. <laughs> I wonder what's happened. I think she's got a thorn. It looked like she had a thorn stuck in her foot. So the ears on an elephant are used as big radiators. They cool the elephant's blood down and therefore coring their, uh, keeping their core uh, body temperature cool. Um, but baby elephants being a bit smaller, they don't need to flap their ears as much as large elephants do. And so you find that they keep them folded over themselves like we saw there. and tight to their bodies, as you can see, with very little flapping going on. Now, mom is still feeding very calm. Baby's just standing in the sun. I think the baby actually moved out of the shade to go and stand in the sun to warm up. Very, very nice setting. You can see this female in profile, you can see her forehead. It's very angled, you see that angle on her forehead in profile? That will help you determine the sex of an elephant from far away if you can just see the head. Male elephant have a big dome on the front, not that angle that you can see so pronounced on this female. The Jackson X um, has just asked me a question which I've promptly forgotten. I'm so sorry, Rebecca, if you wouldn't mind just repeating that for me. Ah, so Jackson, you've asked me um, why elephants communicate in such low frequencies. They actually communicate in a very wide set of frequencies from an from a, a infrasound, which is ultra low, um, ultra low wave or ultra low frequency, sorry, all the way up to a massively high pitched squeal scream. Now, they use the low frequency calls to communicate in thick bush because low frequency waves, sound waves, are, are less prone to being deflected away from or by, by thick vegetation. And so they can keep contact with one another over large distances up to six miles using these low frequency calls. And then they use the high-pitched screams when they are anguished or when they are being attacked. They trumpet and they scream. So their, their range of sound is actually incredible. They can generate a massive range of sound. Um, using it for different things. The scream is usually rage or being upset or angry. Having a look at this little one coming right up to us. So mom has now excavated the, the ditch and now baby is coming to see what titbits can be found in the excavation that mommy's made. And let's see if 
she's learnt. I think it's a female. She looks dainty enough to be a female. There we go. Just pulled off a little root. Didn't quite get the whole motion. I think there was a little bit too much effort going on there. There we go. Also, a bit of a head shake. Just practicing for one day when she's bigger. Tony Blige just made an, a nice comment to say that if it's cold, would an elephant fold their ears back to keep them warm? I would say absolutely. I've never read anything about that, Tony, but it makes 100% perfect sense. I agree with you there. I think if it's cold, keeping the ears close to the body will help retain body heat and reduce air, air friction over the, the, the actual ears, which will then obviously cool the blood down further, and they can keep their ears next to their body for heat so yes absolutely I agree with you I think on that note let's send you over to Jamie I'm sure she's dying to give you an update I simply couldn't wait to give you an update <laughs> um, actually I just really wanted to show you this glorious morning view that we have it also provides an opportunity to stop and bask in the Sun and listen for alarm calls because I do actually have an update for you, and that is that at some point last night, a male leopard walked straight through this area. I'm really hoping for Tingana, but I don't think that the tracks are big enough. It might be Sindile, from where we last had his tracks. I'm trying to figure out exactly where he's gone. The difficulty with following a male leopard's tracks, particularly ones that I think came from early last night, is that leopards, when they want to, cover enormous distances when they are on the move. Uh, there's a chance that he is already on the other side of Arethusa at this point. Now, his tracks have come into the block over here towards the old hyena den. They haven't popped out yet, but I just want to double check that and make sure because generally a male leopard won't stay in the same place. Now I've got a bit of a blocked nose. So I can't really smell anything. Luckily for me, Jandre can, so I made him jump out of the car and go and sniff the weeping wattle that the tracks led right up to. He says he can't smell buttered popcorn. He then asked if we could go back to camp to get some buttered popcorn because he wanted some at that point, um, which we haven't done. Sorry, Jandre. I'm sorry, Jandre. We've got a leopard to find. We've got all kinds of things to find. Uh, somewhere around here lurks a male leopard. It's just a question of how far he has walked at some point in the night because those tracks were not fresh fresh and if he did urine scent if he did scent mark on that tree which it seems like he didn't which again immediately makes us think perhaps a leopard like Sindile that won't be marking territory yet but if he did scent mark it it's already completely dry and there's no sign of it but I uh, with all due respect to Jandre's sense of smell, which I have no, I, no doubt is totally keen, as keen as any human beings could be, um, I don't think we have quite the level of sensitivity that a leopard might. It was very funny watching him sniff the bush, though. I actually should have tried to get that on live. He climbed right in to give it a jolly heave. He was committed. He was fully committed to the search for this leopard. I was suitably impressed. Well done, Jandre. Bravo to you. <laughs> and it keeps stopping at every tree now. Make him check it. <laughs> and the only thing that's walked along this road is a hippo at some point last night. So this leopard, the male leopard, hasn't come out here. This is the area of the enormous blocks, though, and very few roads. We're on the western edge of Juba. Uh, searching for our leopard might be a tricky thing. I'm also hoping that the dwarf mongoose will start coming out soon. In winter they're a little bit lazy, spend some time curled up in the warmth of their termite mound burrows, but it should be warm enough for them to start popping out. Now, just a quick update while we drive around looking for something to show you. 
the team that is in Rwanda has been allocated the Sousa family of gorillas. I hope I'm saying that right, but the Sousa family. And as soon as they start the hike and if they have any kind of signal, then we will be going live with their expedition up into the mountains. So it's really, really exciting. I'm sure that the team there are beside themselves. A team of three, Graham, Emily and Brent. Can you just imagine the excitement going through their minds? And we're all eagerly anticipating and awaiting the news that they do have signal. Catifia squamosa, Catifia squamosa, Catifia squamosa. Thank you to Bayleaf Lady who has suggested that that might be the answer to our moth question. I did check in my insect book, by the way. I checked and there was no sign of it in the book. Over to Steph, whose Ellie's are doing something. Sorry we rushed you back from Jamie like this, but this little youngster has just started to nurse from his mom and you can see a very, very intimate view there of how babies suckle. So they lift the trunk above the head and then they use their mouths to cup the mammary gland in the mouth and it's perfectly shaped for the baby to get right in there she will also suckle left to right and right to left mom will decide which one let's see how long she allows the baby to suckle for this is such a special moment everyone you know elephants are fairly common and we get to see them all the time but to see a little baby nursing from his mom like this is just a real special occasion she's obviously comfortable enough with us to let this happen baby's comfortable enough with us to do this and have a look at how her little trunk is busy caressing mom in the armpit there. She could fold it over her head and let it flop down her back but she doesn't. She keeps tactile pressure with mom. Very similar to how a baby would hold on to her mom's skin or to her mom's hair when they're nursing. Really, really special moment. So from our side we can hear little sucking noises every now and again when the vacuum is broken. We can hear a little squeak. Look at the trunk, just touching mom all the time. She's standing with her leg forward. Now she moves her leg back. That's a sign that she wants to stop. They don't suckle for very long. Oh. She obviously carries on eating. This is nothing new for her, <laughs> even though it's so special for us. There, she's now kicked him off by bringing her front leg back and breaking his hold, or her hold, I should say. There you can see under her armpit, have a look at it, you can see it when she lifts or goes forward like as you might be able to see. Let's see when she walks out from under the... Let's see what happens. Literally just a two or three minute... So Dawn and Kerry have asked me how old this baby Ellie is and how can I tell? Well Dawn, it's, at a year they get their first tusks erupting through their, their mouth and so we can't see any tusks so it's younger than a year. Judging from the dexterity of the trunk, the trunk stays quite floppy for the first six months. Baby elephant can't really use their trunk for the first six months so that gives you another horizon. So I would say that this little baby is approaching six months 
of of age. I don't think she's quite past six months. I would almost say she's probably between four and a half and six months. So I'm giving myself a sort of six to eight week window here um, in my estimate, judging from her size and from those two markers. So the first marker would be looking underneath the lip to see if we can see a tusk. There's no tusks there, so she's not a year old. And then to have a look at how well that t the trunk functions, how much motor control they have over the trunk. And she has a little bit. I was watching her pick up a stick a little bit earlier and put it in her mouth. So she definitely can use her, her, um, she can definitely use her, her trunk. But she's not using it for everything. It's sort of just hanging there and she's bashing bushes around with it and she's picking something up. So she's getting there, but she's not quite there just yet. So I would say that she's probably around about six months, less than six months old, four and a half to six months old. With um, her being able to nurse, she'll nurse like she just did, like we just saw there now for the next 24 months or so. So that's not a, an indication just yet. We'll start seeing those tusks come out from under the lip. They get two sets of tusks. They get six sets of molars, but they get two sets of tusks with their first set erupting out of their mouth and falling out at about a year old. And then their, their adult tusks start to come through after that. Quite nice, eh? Oh, I'm very, very glad we got to share that little intimate moment with you. It's not very often you see baby elephants nursing like that, and especially not of the view that we got where you could see the trunk holding on to mom and just keeping that tactile response, just keeping that trunk holding tight onto mom, feeling there and just making sure that the bond is still there between mom and baby. A real, really special, special thing that we got to witness there. I'm very happy. Let's see if we can get another angle on these Ellie's. Ah, Shamsung has asked the inevitable question from the uh, the left or right twist of the trunk and the slave tusk. Is is it necessarily a fact that the left twist on a trunk is equal to the le a left slave tusk and a right twist and a right slave tusk? And the answer to that, Shamsung, is absolutely not. I have seen slave tusks used on a right twisted elephant or a left-handed slave tusk used on a right twist elephant and a left hand slave tusk on a left twist elephant so i discounted that a couple of years ago in an observation on some illies but absolutely carry on watching every time you see some elephant see if you can see what twist an elephant's trunk is and quite often the dead giveaway there is you have a look for staining so if this was a trunk and I twist that way around grass or I twist that way around grass, this side or this side of the elephant's trunk will be stained a different color, usually green. It's like a greenish yellow stain. So if the elephant twists this way, it'll be done this way. If she twists that way, it'll be on this side of the trunk. So that would be a dead giveaway. And then have a look at that. Now, Jamie has been looking for, well, we've all been looking for a giraffe. Uh, from a request from a little bit earlier and Jamie's just bumped into a giraffe so we'll catch up with you in a bit Here you go Tiffany this is for you because I know how much you love giraffe and that you feel like you've been missing seeing them We've actually got two here for you, but they're playing really hard to get hiding behind the trees and the leaves I'm sure Tiffany can tell us plenty about these amazing animals, but for newer viewers, this is a female giraffe, and I know that just by looking at her head, because the horns on top of them are very thin, and they're tufted with black hair, which immediately tells us it's a female and not a male, since she, since the males use their ossicones, or their horns, on the top of their head for fighting, so they're a lot more well-developed. And just look at this giraffe sticking her face right into what looks like a highly unpleasant tree to nibble on. And as we watch her feed here, we can see so clearly all of the adaptions that allow a giraffe to do something like this. First of all, every now and again, you'll see 
the very first flash of her bright purple tongue. And that's because it's enforced with, reinforced with a pigment called melanin, which we will all be familiar with. Now, melanin is a very tough pigment, so it protects and it toughens the inside, what would normally be a sensitive inside of her mouth. There you can see how well developed the muscular structure of her lips work at, at sort of negotiating around the thorns and navigating around the thorns and nimbly plucking away the leaves. Oh, there we go. She gave us a perfect demonstration of her purple tongue by sticking it in her nostril. <laughs> She's also cleaning, by the way, that was to clean leaves and stuff out of the nostril itself. The nostrils are small and flattened and close up completely when she sticks her head into the thorny part of the tree. She closes them up to stop the thorns from sort of poking her in the sensitive mucus layer. And then if you look, watch her eyes, they're protected by very thick eyelashes that guard against the thorns damaging the eye at all. Very, very and a long face so that she can reach forward and get right into the thick of the trees. There we go. And you can see why Tiffany loves them so much. Incredible looking animals. I find the longer I look at a giraffe, the stranger they start to look. I don't know what it is about them. There's just something. And perhaps it's the structure of their head. But they are beautiful in their own way. And I'd love to show you sort of their long neck and their long legs, but unfortunately most of her is hidden behind the trees, away from where we can get to see her. I'm trying to work out where the other one went, but I, because I think we might have a better view of her. Hold on. Let's try. Let's go back a bit. If we can't get a view of her, then we'll go forward and resume our place with this view of our female giraffe. Apparently once upon a time Blobbit McBlob wanted to be a giraffe and thought the best way of going about such a project might be to pop his face into a cactus or her face, I'm uncertain. The name Blobbit McBlob is relatively, um, could apply to both male and female. So Blobbit McBlob, apparently that didn't work out terribly well for you. I'm sorry to hear that. It w certainly wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> Nothing says I'm a giraffe better than trying to poke yourself full of holes. <laughs> you can hear the oxpeckers chirping away on the back of these giraffe. So much for my better view of the second one, I don't even know where the second giraffe has gone. Which is amazing when you think about it, that a almost one ton animal that stands close to 15 up to even 18 feet in the air, amazing how they actually disappear and blend into their surroundings. And hi to Aubrey, who is a new viewer. Aubrey, you were wondering about what the little antenna on her head are used, are used for. That's the best name I've ever heard for a giraffe's ossicones, their, their antenna. So for the females, they don't really actually have much of a use. That's why they're so thin and very much reduced and they have hair on the top of them. For the males, they combine, they're called ossicones because the giraffe, unlike the antelope, where they grow their horns as they grow older. Giraffe is actually born with those. They, they fall flat and they're quite floppy. They're cartilaginous. Cart, let's just say we're made of cartilage. How's that? Um, and then they pop back up and they start to get reinforced with bone. So they're born with them, which is why they're referred to actually correctly as ossicones, although I have to tell you, Aubrey, I'm going to be calling them antenna for the rest of the sighting. So her antenna are not used for very much. 
But for male giraffe, they play a very, very important role. So they combine the effect of the ossicones with a protrusion that grows up from between their eyes on their skull, as well as two at the back of their ossicones, behind their ears. And they swing their heads round and batter each other whenever they fight. And that's usually fighting over females because giraffe are not territorial. But you can imagine, I mean, a giraffe's skull alone having picked one up before, probably weighs close to 12 kilograms, 25-odd pounds. And that's just the skull. Now, if you combine that with the weight of the muscles and the flesh around it, it probably weighs close to about 44-odd pounds. Now, put that on the end of a six-feet-long neck and imagine that swinging around with force propelled by very powerful muscles. And you get an idea of just the level of impact that a collision with a giraffe's head has. So what they do is they, it's called necking, weirdly enough. It's called necking, and they swing their necks around and they whack each other on the sides, on the legs, on the buttocks, and that's how they fight. And you, must, you should see some of the slow motion footage of giraffe fighting. It is incredible when they really seriously fight. It's amazing what they can do. So that's why the male giraffe have them. Female, it's just a kind of evolutionary residual ossicone antenna that they have on the top of their head. Perhaps we could ask them if we could borrow them to broadcast from Rwanda. Um, might not work. Either way, um, that is what giraffe, and funnily enough, we've always, all of us have grown up with this idea that, and I know our giraffe are playing really hard to get now, is some legs. <laughs> <laughs> We've grown up with this idea that giraffe have these long legs and long necks because that's how they compete for food. Basically, they got taller and taller so they could eat lots of food above everybody else's heads. She's got some scaly knees there. Um, she needs some... In South Africa, we have ingrams. I don't know what you have elsewhere in the world, but in South Africa, we have ingrams for cracked knees. It's actually... There's a new theory evolutionary-wise, and it applies to the dinosaurs with long necks as well. And that suggests that it might be a fighting advantage. So an evolu evolutionary advantage, the male with the longer neck, because of the way that giraffe fight, might have been more successful and therefore passed along the genetics for longer and longer necks until giraffes stand at the height that they currently stand at. Now, an interesting little thing, I mean, all of us always, we've been raised to believe that a long neck is so that it can eat the leaves at the top of the trees. But they actually spend a lot of, particularly the females, they spend a lot of times feeding lower than they could otherwise. Another cool physical adaption of a giraffe, as she walks past us with her head held high, that is her natural position of her head. Oh. Actually, she, you can see the moment of indecision there. I think I'm done, but I'm going to go back. But she's got a very thick tendon that runs down the back of her neck and holds her head up like that. She has to contract to pull her head down. And we've got two females here, believe it or not. In fact, I think I know these two females vaguely. I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think it's the two females I've seen recently with a young male. They were playing and skipping around. The second one is to the left of the first, but almost impossible for us to see. There we go, got the top of her head. Now, giraffe, as I said, are not territorial and they're quite happy to form loose herds with whom, whomsoever happens to be around. But quite often you get a mother-daughter combination, which brings us to Dawn's question. And good morning, Dawn. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You wanted to know about a giraffe's gestation. It's just under a year and a half, so around 15, 16 months. And no, they don't stay with their mums their whole lives. Obviously the males immediately go off and become not solitary, but they can lead a solitary existence. Once they reach the age of about two or so, they start to move away from her, possibly even younger in the case of the males. The females might stick around with mom, just because it's kind of that connection with her, it's safety and numbers. Um, so you will often see females staying with their mothers even once they've reached adulthood. But they have absolutely no compunction about moving off, going off on their own, maybe fo finding another group of giraffe, hanging out with them for a while. So they've got a very loose herd structure. There's nothing formalized about it. Baby giraffe are the cutest thing. I know we say that pretty much about every single baby animal that we see. It just happens to be what we're seeing at the time. 
but they really are, and they're totally disproportionate. They have short, shorter necks, much shorter necks than the adults, and I don't just mean because they're smaller, I mean proportionately shorter necks and proportionately longer legs, because they've got to be able to fit under mom's tummy to suckle from her, and yet at the same time, with her six feet long legs, she walks very fast, and her baby's got to be able to keep up with her. And they're born with very long, funny legs and very rather stumpy necks. They look most peculiar. There you can see she's contracting her neck muscles to bring her head down. And because of the way that giraffe are adapted to deal with their head being so far away from their heart, with a delicate system of valves and spongy, spongy absorptive Oh, goodness, all the long words. I'm going to stick to simple words today. The long words are not working for me. Um, so with spongy absorbing tissue in their brains, what that means is that they actually can't have their heads much lower than their hearts for extended time periods, because if they do, they faint. It's just because they're adapted to deal with pushing blood up against gravity to the brain. So if they drink, if you watch them drink, you know they've got that wonderful long-legged wide stance that they perform whenever they have to reach down to drink. It'll usually be for about 30 seconds or less. And it's not uncommon to hear of giraffes fainting, fainting when they drink. Hey girl, that tree is just proving to be the most delicious breakfast a giraffe could possibly have. She walked away from it briefly and then decided it was foolish and went back to it. And welcome to Mary on our sunrise safari. Mary's wondering about our lovely giraffe relatives and what animals have ossicones and what animals are related to them. The, the most defining, I, I can't think right now off the top of my head of an animal with ossicones, but I'm sure there is and it'll come to me. There's nothing in this area that has ossicones. There is a close relative of the giraffe in Africa called an okapi. And carpi is a very peculiar looking, kind of looks like a combination between an antelope and a, and a giraffe, like if they'd mixed together. They're very, very curious looking creatures. Giraffe are also related to camels in that you can see that relationship in the way that they walk, where both legs on the left hand side move at one time and then both on the right. Usually with things like leopards, lions, antelope, anything like that, they walk with right front back left moving at the same time and then front left back right moving at the same time. That makes sense, sort of a cross almost. Whereas with giraffe they move on the same side. What that means is that they're only capable of two strides. One is a walk, a normal walk, the other is a gallop. They cannot trot in the same way that zebra trot. It would look very peculiar with one side each moving. We're going to move on from our giraffe now because I have a feeling that she's going to be moving on very shortly. I'm going to go and check Red Dam on Arethusa while we do that. <laughs> bye bye girl. While we do that, let's go across to Steph and find out what his plans are for the rest of the morning. I've come to check Cheetah Cut Line and um, I want to do that because it's just such a mix up of tracks around the Buffelsuk Dam den site. It's really, really difficult to try and sift out fresh tracks from not fresh tracks, tracks from yesterday morning versus last night, it's difficult for me. I'm not that good a tracker. So what I'm doing is I'm basically decomplicating it by making it, the area that I'm looking at a little bit wider. And what I'm hoping to do is find where the fresh tracks cross out or fresh tracks cross in. Give us a better idea of where we think these lioness are. Um, they don't seem to be hanging around Bivelzook Dam. I can't see any noticeable vulture activity, so so far the vultures that are flying around or have managed to take off this morning haven't 
located anything for us. I haven't heard anything except for those male lions that were roaring a bit earlier on today. I do think that those male lions are on our traverse. Um, male lions can sometimes walk also in straight lines like leopard do. They cross roads and they'll cross roads very quickly, maybe just one track. And so difficult to find these cats sometimes. It's on days like this that I really miss Herbert and I really miss uh, Brent. Their commitment to following these big things, these big animals, is just enviable. So right now, all I'm busy doing is I'm literally combing an area, a cut line that I know has got very good sand for tracking, and to try and see if we can find a place where these lions perhaps crossed out. I can say, though, that uh, they didn't cross north into Bilvers Hook. So far, they haven't crossed east into Torchwood. So my gut feel is telling me that they are somewhere on Juma. Which means that we just have to find them, basically. Uh, Michael, you watching this morning, you're only 18 years old, I think I've answered one of your questions this morning already and it's good that you're sending another one and you've just asked how does one become a field guide, what made me become a field guide? Uh, Michael, I think two things are really important, you, you, you've got to want to be outside and you've got to have a love for people. Now those are not usually mutually compatible with one another, generally people who want to be outside and in the bush are not very people orientated people and people oriented people don't always want to be in a place like this which is uh, quite often full of solitude and, and loneliness. But in field guiding I found, for me at least, the perfect mix. I could be outside which is what I love and where I love being but I'm also with people 24-7 and that I only realized when I was sort of 19 I think was when I realized that I didn't want to ever be alone ever again. I don't enjoy being on my own. I don't enjoy spending time in my own company. Right, we've got tracks of a female leopard here. Relatively fresh tracks and I'm going to show you why I think that. And then Michael, I'll come back to your question in a second. Let me just see if I can show you the tracks. I have no doubt that this is Karula making her rounds. And this, she's a funny cat, I must be honest with you. She has got the most bizarre habits. Here's her tracks here. All right, Gert, we're battling a bit to get you a... All right, let's go and find you a different one. Just like I was saying, she's a, she's a funny cat in that. Her tracks were called in this morning going in exactly the opposite direction, probably about a kilometer from here. And now we find them going back. She can walk this animal, I promise you. She's, she definitely knows what she wants. And that makes her incredibly difficult to track, footprint for footprint, because you can't really predict where she's going to be. Let me show you a track here of her. This is really fresh. Done last night, early this morning. Yeah, she is here. Inside there are her tracks. Dainty tracks. She's got, um, she's got a, re a really, uh, I don't know how to put it. She's got a really feminine track. It's a really pretty little track. This leopardess here. with a giraffe track next to it. Now, a little bit further down the road, her track was on top of the giraffe track. And that's how I know that it was done, probably last night. This giraffe walked down the road here yesterday, and she has now walked on top of that last night. She moves a lot with her, she moves a lot when she doesn't have cubs. In this particular instance, with her having cubs, she moves even more, I would imagine. She was seen yesterday morning 
This is our eastern boundary. She was seen yesterday morning on our southern boundary. Her tracks just now crossed out of our northern boundary and now they are back on this road going down the road heading south on our eastern boundary. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> All right, so back to field guiding. So um, when I became a field guide, uh, Michael, the, um, you, there were no schools for becoming field guide. Everything was trained sort of in-house at companies that employed field guides with no experience. I was lucky enough, and it was just by chance, um, a, ch a, a by chance conversation, that um, I ended up going for an interview at a company called Sabi Sabi. They, they luckily enough did have an in-house training uh, arm or division and they trained me up. I'm just having a look at this junction here to see what comes out of the, the road. I'll be with you in a sec. So nothing comes out of Torchwood. except Karula goes into it. So Karula's moved off of our Travers, east into Torchwood. Let's see if she comes back a little bit further down the road. Um, and then I spent uh, the next six months I spent in training, busy learning the basics of how to become a field guide and all the knowledge. Um, and it didn't take me until I'd been in the bush for two years before I felt comfortable enough with my knowledge to be able to guide most people. And I didn't stop learning for the next 15 years. Um, in actual fact, still trying to get qualifications and experience. There's still qualifications that I don't have in this particular industry, some of which you're only eligible when you've been guiding for 15 to 20 years. Some of the tracking qualifications and the wilderness guiding qualifications, you only really can build up enough hours to be able to be eligible for the assessment after 15 years of doing it almost every single day. So this, it's, it's, a, it's an industry with a lot of depth to it. Um, nowadays, there are schools that help you to become field guides. You don't have to be employed by a company that has an in-house training division. There are schools dotted all over the country, uh, South Africa, that will help you to become a field guide. And a lot of them even offer a six-month course that will give you the basics that you need, similar to what I went through, and then will offer you employment for six months as well, so that you get an experience behind the qualification. And then it's just a matter of, I don't know, finding a place to graft yourself to. All over Africa, there's game rangers and field guides and a need for both. But I hope that answered your question there, Michael. Being 18, I know that... So Kathy Board has just asked me what the difference is between a safari guide and a safari ranger. And I think I was just going to get, I was just going to answer that for, uh, for Mike as well, in that a game ranger is based in the conservation industry and it's a scientific person. A, a game ranger is a, is a conservationist. A field guide is based in the hospitality industry and is an, an entertainer, um, for, for lack of a better word. We've got a Steenbuck there. Before he runs away, I think I just want to try and show him to you. No? <laughs> These guys. Sorry for getting my concentration broken there by a little Steenbuck, but that one stood still for a second longer than I thought it would. And then, of course, because we swung the camera onto it, it disappeared into the thickets there. I can still see it. Let's see if we can go forward a little bit and get you a long range shot. Right next to that monkey thorn there. And there we go. Let's see if I go back a bit. There we go. <laughs> it's so difficult getting you with that. Is a Steenbuck. We saw a Dacre a little bit earlier this morning, that's a um, dwarf antelope. This is the other more common dwarf antelope that we have here. That's full grown, a whole 10 pounds of animal. An arid area specialist. You find them all over the drier parts of the country. Desert all the way through to semi-desert and into savannah. And he's a browser. Eats leaves and twigs. 
relying on keeping very still to get out of the way of predators. It's camouflage and concealment. And then when it does get found, it jinks incredibly fast. They can jink from side to side. I've actually seen one out to maneuver a cheetah, believe it or not. And that one's now standing still enough to have a look at us. All right, so back to that question about the game rangers and field guides. So field guide is based in the hospitality industry and is an entertainer primarily. A game ranger is a scientist that is based in the conservation industry. And those are the primary differences. Now here's a steenbuck right next to us. No, it's a female. The one we were looking at was the male. I have no doubt that these are this, that they are a pair with one another. This one doesn't have any horns. The other one we were looking at had, had some horns. And they live in a tiny little territory, usually not together. They are a bonded pair, a monogamous pair, but you usually find them apart from one another. They're only really together at certain times. You, you've, it's quite uncommon to actually find them around one another. And this one, very relaxed with us, unlike any of the others. Full grown as well, that's a full grown female, mature female. They have one baby at a time, and when that baby is mature, that baby will leave the natal territory and wander a little bit, and will then find a partner and set up their own little territory. And because they get eaten by virtually everything from snakes to eagles to leopard, lion, quite often there are vacancies in relationships that need to be filled and that's how they get their new territories two facts that I find interesting about the Steenbuck is that they bury their dung so they will kick open a little scrape they defecate in that scrape and then they scrape sand over it and that's to mask their scent and given a chance they will give birth to their babies in disused aardvark burrows. So they give birth, or they are known to give birth, subterranean. How's that for a bizarre fact? And there she goes. I'm actually quite happy that we got to see the male and the female in such a close proximity. Only really possible at this time of the year when it's so dry and there's no no grass cover. In summertime it's tough to see these guys. Alright so Mike to finish off the conversation with you the best is to decide uh, what type of person you are and what you like to do. Uh, if you're more scientifically based and you enjoy being on your own in the bush then a game ranger is what you need to go and study. If you enjoy being with people and being out in the bush then field guiding is definitely the answer for you. Right, and I think on that note, it would be a good time to send you through to Jamie for an update. Uh, I am at Red Dam. Red Dam, which is as full as I have ever seen Red Dam. And today, no hippopotamus waiting in the corner. And in fact, no, no nothing at Red Dam. I don't even see a bird, do you, Jandre? Yeah. You got a bird? Oh, wow. Um. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, action here at Red Dam. We've got the ubiquitous Cape Turtle Dove, Jandre, giving us a fantastic demonstration of his camera skills. So, high action here at Red Dam, pretty much the same as when we were last here, except the last time we were here, a brown-headed parrot was chasing the Cape Turtle Doves around, which was a new one for me. I've never seen that before. But, Red Dam is quiet. Our leopard did not come here. Ryan tells me that there are male tracks crossing back into Juma, which suggests our male leopard did a little bit of a loop through Arethusa and back. However, exciting news is that, apparently, Shadow, 
came through to the Arethusa Lodge last night to pay them all a visit. She was in the Staff Village. Oh, we'll go and investigate and see if she's not there. Ryan's tracker tells me he heard alarm calls first thing in the morning around that drainage line system that is Shadow's favorite spot. So we're going to go see if we can't investigate that. For those of you who are joining us for the first time and for whom that must have been a hugely confusing sentence, we're going to go look for a female leopard on very close to one of the other safari lodges around here. A female leopard with a four-month-old leopard cub, since I haven't had any luck with Karula, her mother, and her little ones. And since all is quiet at Red Dam, there's not a track. Well, that's not true. There's lots of tracks. There's not a leopard track to be seen. Lots and lots of tracks. But they're all mostly zebra. We shall go and see what we can see in that direction. Bye bye, Cape Turtle Doves. Thank you for the excitement. Now, I know this might be a combination of the fact that it's just the dry season, but it really feels as though with this drought, the landscape is changing in front of our faces. Now, I don't just mean because it looks dry, I mean because the elephants have, they are so intently trying to find the nutrients that they need that they're targeting tree after tree after tree and the trees are just falling like flies, sort of. It's not really a good expression, it's not really appropriate. But it really does feel as though this vegetation is thinning out, not just in terms of the way that leaves have dried off and died off, but just in terms of the number of trees that the elephants have pushed over. And it feels like every time I drive a road, I see new elephant damage, which is completely to be expected. But it really does feel as though the landscape is changing. And actually, I mean, it will all be part of a natural cycle, the way that this place has evolved to be. And it's been important to remember that this land has been dealing with drought for centuries and centuries in its current form. So it will recover, but what we might get is some really nice open patches in places. It's almost part of a recovery of the land itself in a way. Since at some point this would have been farmland, would have been land that was overgrazed, which explains why in places there is a lot of what we call bush encroachment, where the trees have grown up far more than the grass layer. They've taken over the grass layer. That would be very nice to see some opening up and some changes to the landscape. And Christopher, just talking about our weather but on a much smaller scale, good morning to Christopher, we'd like to know what sort of weather has the biggest effect on animal behavior, wind. Any kind of seriously windy weather you immediately see the changes in the animals themselves. What you'll see is all of the prey species, anything from zebra to steenbok, they become more nervous. The predators are actively hunting because they've got the advantage of the fact that the, pre the prey animals can't hear and they can't smell as well as they would normally. So a windy day has probably the biggest effect. Rainy days, rainy days actually present you with relatively good game viewing because it's not as though the animals can run for shelter and very often the cats are more active than they might otherwise be. Nothing can sleep like a lion or a leopard when they want to, especially when it's hot. But on a cool rainy day, they're often around and about looking slightly bedraggled but are nevertheless up to something. And seriously, stormy weather is probably the scariest for the prey species. And we are the intrepid team of Wild Earth, and no matter the weather, we are out and about filming li wildlife live to stream to your living rooms, except when it's really raining very hard. So Laura, no. Unfortunately, we have not yet managed to master a system that allows us to drive out and drive in the rain. We can in light drizzle. Um, all that it means is that Jean-André has to wipe the screen a few times more than he might otherwise. 
and we get a little bit bedraggled and a bit cold but we've got wonderful rain covers that uh, basically redirect all of the rain away from the technology and down to my lower back that's how we deal with the drizzle works very very well um, protects all the electronic equipment because as you can imagine we've got quite a lot of sensitive stuff there we've got rain covers for the cameras which often take the form of black bags to help to sort of reinforce the the whole deal uh, we can deal with small amounts of rain we cannot deal with a torrential downpour this year has been a drought so we haven't had to cancel all that many drives but what we usually do is we hope for it and some of the, the rain tend to tends to come in short bursts not that it came much at all this year no sorry just zebra tracks so we can usually wait it out in the safety of the garage or where we park the cars where we shout across to all the viewers to let them know that it's raining just to make sure they know that we are not slacking but other than that there's not much that will keep us from going out oh and we've had to once or twice we've had to delay the start of drive because it's been too hot then this summer was particularly it's the worst summer I've ever experienced in this area just because there was no relief in terms of thunderstorms but the cameras have shut down on us before as have staff and <laughs> when it gets really really hot I don't know where all the animals have gone over the last two days my lucky streak appears to have not run out it's just well I suppose you can't have a good day every day it's not a zoo animals do their thing and we have to have slow days to remind us just how amazing the fast days are when there's lots of stuff happening all around us So while I sip on my tea and try and work out why I'm not on the road I thought I was going to be on, let's go across to Steph and find out how his morning is going. <laughs> it's nice to know that after all these months and months of driving around that Jamie still doesn't know where she is in Arethusa. <laughs> Although that's like the pot calling the kettle black in this particular instance. I also don't know where I am on Arethusa most of the time. Now. What we've been doing for the last little bit is we went down Cheetah Cutline, our, our, our eastern boundary. For as long as I thought it was feasible and no tracks, no clear tracks crossed over east. Now I've come, in, I'm come down Mamba Road. Now Mamba Road is a very clear east-west road which will obviously show us any movement of lion north and south. And so far I can say that there's no lion tracks that have crossed from the north to the south. So it would lead me to believe that unless we've missed something, that the lions are between Mamba Road and Bovazo Cut Line somewhere, which is not too much. We're slowly starting to decrease the area where I think these lions can be. Excuse me, swatting at myself every now and again. It's heated up and so the flies are just starting their daily torture routine on me. I think they take some sadistic pleasure at making me hit myself as often as they can before the end of a drive. Right, so now I'm just checking to see if they don't cross in the Mulwati. It's quite uncommon for lion to walk on the sand. It takes a lot of effort and usually they just walk across the sand. Not on it. And true to form, there's nothing that was walking in the riverbed there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and look at twin dams. Actually, no. Why don't we, no, I am going to look at twin dams. I want to see if we can find any tracks of those male lions that were roaring a bit earlier this morning. Because the theory in my mind is this. Is... 
if the females hunted something last night and the males heard it, the males would have come to the females to try and steal their kill or steal their food, potentially. And they, when the sun caught or when dawn caught those lions, they would have roared this morning from that position. And the last time we had tracks, although divergent, they were almost in the same vector to one another. And I'm wondering if they're not lying together here somewhere on a kill. And so what I want to try and do is just figure out exactly where these different tracks are. All a bit of a puzzle, a lot of speculation, a lot of guessing from incomplete and inaccurate in information. But nevertheless, it keeps the juices flowing. Let's go this way. I quite often like to cross over this road. Some impala in front of us. Actually, we're surrounded by impala. He's standing in the shade. Already have moved into the shade for today. I don't think it's so much to do with the heat and the last little bit of vegetation is actually still hidden amongst the greenery in these drainage lines. Quite weird to see a bachelor herd of impala. Oh, there's a kudu as well. Wow. Lovely. So we're seeing a lot of male kudu. Yesterday we saw an absolutely enormous kudu. Also a male, young male, not an old male. Lovely striped coat that they've got here. Eh? Same color as the bush. Look at him disappear there. Eh? Literally can only see his leg, that's it. Amazing. Summertime, really difficult to see these big kudu. They sort of, they sort of blend in so well with the greenery. They're actually only seen when they're crossing an open road. All right, let's carry on going and see if we can pick up any tracks here on these game paths. The reason why I'm using this road is quite often we see these male lions cross over this road and although they won't walk on Weaver's Nest Road or tw they do walk on Twin Dan's Road a lot, if they're not on Twin Dan's Road and they're not on Weaver's Nest Road then they're crossing over this road here. A couple of big game paths and this sort of leads directly to both Buffleshook Dam and to Voyatella Pan from here. With Biffleshook Dam being there and Vuyatela Pan being ahead of us. Ah, it's such a lovely smell out here. The, there's a lot of potassium uh, and a lot of sodium in the soil here. And around this time of the year, the dust that the car kicks up into the cabin here has this very salty sort of smell to it and it's 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 almost characteristic of this particular area is this dry season smell that we get here and it's something that I've just I love smelling of all the years it brings up it conjures up such fantastic memories all the good times and all the many many years that I've spent in the Sabi sands just checking here it's not an uncommon place for us to see lions crossing from this side over to this side. What I'm really hoping for now is either to catch a glimpse of one of them lying up in the shade or some tracks that are fresher than the ones that we've been seeing. In other words, on top of all else, on top of birds, on top of any of the animals that are moving around. All right. Well, 
while we scour the bush here, it would be a good thing to go and hear what Jamie's got up to in Arethusa, if she's managed to find a way out of there yet. <laughs> See you in a bit. I have indeed found my way through Arethusa. I know exactly where I am now. I knew exactly where I was before. I just didn't know how I got there. It wasn't exactly where I was intending to be. But that's okay. And just take the we're taking the scenic route not that any route isn't sort of scenic through here but you get you get my drift we have made our way into or about to make our way into the river systems that shadow so loves to hide herself in hopefully she's going to be somewhere well we're going to see if we can find her tracks for the last few moments of or the last half an hour of the sun sunrise safari something is running over there but I think it was a little Dacre. Okay, just a squirrel. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, go up a little bit, Jandre. Oh, there it is. It's hidden there. It managed to grab something and is nibbling away at whatever particular food it managed to find. What have you got there? Is that nice? Sounds like it stole it from the arrow barked babblers. They sound very cross, the birds that you can hear. What on earth is that? It's so difficult, and if I move, that, sh that squirrel's going to run away. Some kind of seed husk or something similar. Industriously chewing away at it. Perhaps some kind of tuber or something. It seems to be stripping it away. Using its little hands to turn it. And then incredibly sharp teeth, speaking from experience. In fact, just ask Steph about how sharp. A hey, squirrel's teeth are. There we go. Ooh, I don't know what that is. Could even be a bagworm, maybe. Bagworm is a type of moth larvae that collects a whole load of plant material and bark around it, so it looks like a little moving piece of debris. Oh, done. Time to groom? Or did you just drop it? All finished. Hmm. Don't know. Mystery meal. Okay, let's carry on. See if we can't find Shadow. While we do, PK, wondering about Karula's cubs' real names as opposed to the names that James picked for them. Um, PK, their official names. This is Hyena. Uh, the female is called Shongile, meaning the beautiful one or beautiful, and her male cub is called Hosanna, meaning little chief or little prince, essentially, which can then be when he's older and bigger and strong and a big fearsome or inspiring male leopard can be changed to Hosan, meaning big chief, but for now he's just a little chief. So Shongile and Hosanna, Shongile is spelled X O N. G I L E Hosanna H O S A N A. And if you have any further questions, I'm afraid for now in this drainage system I might not be able to hear them. Sorry. Let's just go through this dip and then we can try again. Speaking of our naming practice, I'm just doing a quick check around the actual staff village of Arethusa to see if she hasn't popped out. Scott, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. For the most part, yes, the, the names that we give to individual animals are used throughout the reserve to identify them. Sometimes there is some minor confusion. I'm not sure if confusion is the right word. Um, sometimes lodges or places give animals different names to the ones that they've been christened with 
in other areas. The Birmingham boys, for example, are not called the Birmingham boys throughout. They are called the Gowrie males by those further south of the northern Savi sand. So the Gowrie males because they came from the property known as Gauri, which includes Juma, Little Gauri, Torchwood, all of those areas are known as Gauri. So they've become the Gauri males. Uh, sometimes leopards have two different names that different lodges will refer to them by, which is why often if you see on the, if you do some research into the different leopards, if you see their Facebook page or something similar, you might see there's, a, there's two different names given for them. And that is just because not all lodges agree on the names that are given but for the most part, all of the Sabi sand, because we have gone through the official process of naming Karula's cubs, they will all refer to them by that name. Okay. Let us go and check where those alarm calls were heard from. They were heard first thing this morning though, so I would have hoped that she's still in the area. And then of course, some of the stuff is completely unique to our live safaris, some of the naming. So there's no lodge in the world, apart from us, that names their hyenas. We do, because up until recently, we spent a, a, a large amount of time with them. We got to know each and every individual. Personally, I feel like it makes total sense. It's much easier than trying to say that one, is, which is that one that we saw then. It's just much easier to name them and to keep track of them and actually gives you a far greater insight into their dynamics if you can remember which individual is which. And for me that makes total sense rather than just referring to them by their clan names and the Elephant Plains clan or the Juma clan and so on. Especially since the, the hyena clans are not limited to one spot. The only thing I can find at the moment is hyena tracks all over the show and one aeroplane. They're obviously checking that all is in working order. Before the guests depart. She looks vaguely confused. Fair enough. Okay, so we're passing by Arethusa Airstrip. I'm going to do it relatively quickly since all is quiet here. A lot of the animals use the airstrip though, especially now that it has been tarred and in these winter mornings because it retains the heat from the day before. They very often spend the nights there basking in the warmth. Hi! What is interesting is that it feels as though with the birth of the Styx cubs and the Inkohuma cubs, I could be completely wrong about this, but I don't think I am. It feels as though the Birmingham boys spend far less time than they used to on Arethusa. At one point they were going all the way towards Elephant Plains right up into Simbombili. It's been a very long time since we've seen the Birmingham boys on Arethusa itself, which is interesting and I think it's because they've got those cubs so they're focusing their energy on defending that core part of their territory with the sticks and the Inkohumas so around the southern parts of our boundary and then towards where the Inkohumas are but then they've also been going quite far up into Manuleti and I don't know why that may be perhaps it's just that the Salati males are slowly losing their grip I'm not sure they have been pushed quite far by the Birmingham's but I don't know why it is that we haven't had many sightings of Birmingham boys on Arethusa itself. It feels like a very, very long time since we last saw them here. Okay, Skarduvia, which is the nickname I give to Shadow. Her tracks are here. Skarduvia is the Afrikaans word for Shadow, by the way.
beautiful leopard tracks in the morning light. Aren't they lovely? Leaving behind the evidence that we need in order to try and find her. Oh, will she have gone into that favorite patch of hers? I'm trying to check carefully while I'm looking here just to make sure that her cub, or to see whether or not her cub is with her. Doesn't look like it, but again, an area with lots of traffic. That's not a leopard cub. Okay. Let's see how fast I could do this, track and drive and talk at the same time. She's gone. In there. Or her tracks have been driven over. This is one of her favorite spots. We found her here many, many times. Those of you who have been watching or are long-term viewers, you cast your mind back many months ago to when Shadow had an impala kill with Sindile and she kept hissing at him every time he went to go and feed. That was in this block here. Now, of course, she's got a whole different kettle of fish with her little cub. That last time I saw them with the kill, the cub was hissing at mom to stop her from getting any. Which I thought was particularly cheeky. Since it was mom's meal in the first place. And James Richard, speaking of our different leopards of the area, and Shadow and her twin sister Tundi, now James Richard wants to know whether or not there are any updates on Tundi. Last we'd heard she'd given birth to cubs, cub singular, cubs plural, we were never quite sure, it was never confirmed. Um, James, she was last seen wandering about Torchwood, looking to hunt in that area, which is Relative, it's close to Chitwa. It shares a boundary with Chitwa in the form of Gauri, Maine. I haven't heard any updates since then. There's been no confirmation on cubs. I think she's moved the den from where she was keeping them secret and safe. Underneath, well, I say secret and safe. Where she was keeping them underneath a lodge room. Which, as you can imagine, is not really an ideal place to den your cubs. But that was where she'd hidden them. Yeah. She has not come this way, which is just what I wanted to check. Well, let's go and check that back route around the airstrip. Oh, no updates from Tundi just yet, but we'll let you know as soon as we do know about those cubs. It's probably going to be what happened with Karula and her cubs. We were just very lucky in that we, well, that Brent was there for their very first few hours of life. But after that we did basically leave her to do her thing for up to two months before we saw them again. We had a few scares. We were very worried about them. But it was only after about two months that we started to see them properly. And Tandy will probably something, probably be very similar in that respect. I'm going to concentrate in the last few moments of our sunrise safari to see if we can't get a good idea as to where Shadow might have gone. And while we search for her, let's go across to Steph, find out what his plans are for the last portion of our morning safari. Welcome back. We've just been cruising ever decreasing circles <coughs> around the Milwati drainage line for the last 20 minutes or so looking for tracks of that male lion that was busy roaring this morning and I must be honest with you I still haven't found not even a single toe of a track of a male lion what is good though is it looks like those, those female lions that were around Bilfusuk Dam of the Nkuhumas haven't crossed this side either I am almost now certain of the fact that the Inkahuma females are somewhere between Mamba Road and Bivolzo Cut Line and they are on the eastern side of the Milwati drainage line which makes it a lot easier for us to start our search for them this afternoon and that we don't have the whole area to have a look at we've just got a portion of the area to have a look at and who knows what comes out of the woodwork tonight 
all the females with cubs will be moving throughout the day. They will be leaving tracks everywhere. And those males are still an enigma. That male, there were definitely two males roaring this morning. They were definitely, it sounded at least like they were on our traverse somewhere where we are right now. Just really difficult to pinpoint, obviously with, I don't know, maybe the wind was blowing funny. Maybe my ears were playing tricks on me, who knows. But that's our mission, Mission Lion. The mother hasn't returned to the cubs. I went past the den site a little bit earlier this morning. And uh, although the cubs were probably there, there was no female there. And so den sites like that, we just leave right alone. Turned around literally at that instant and came out again. Now, another thing that Wendy's developed is her similar clutch problem that she had a couple of days ago. And this is one of those crossings that is going to present us with one of those issues in that... It's, we're going to require some momentum to get through here. So hold on to your armchairs while we go through here. I need to use the downward speed. And let's see if we can pick it up here. This will be the tester. There we go. All done. I'm starting to learn how to work with this particular problem. <laughs> there we go. So we just sort of, we're not limping just yet. We're still functional and so we're going to carry on going. At least we know what the problem is. It's just a seal that keeps on bursting and we're just waiting for a decent spare part to arrive so we can put it back in. For whatever reason, the seal doesn't like to stay in. And that basically robs us of our clutch. But anyway, there are greater things in the world to worry about than whether or not your clutch on your Land Rover is working. <laughs> I must say, the prediction about it being a, a toasty day is looking like it's coming true. At the moment it's probably around about 25 degrees centigrade. So probably in the 70s or so. There's a male lion track that came out there heading in this direction here. That's good. It didn't come out on the road, but this is nice to know. Here's a male lion track heading back south from where we are now. So Laura in Pennsylvania has just asked me that if the lioness had made a kill and the males stole it, what impact would it have on the three older cubs? Laura, at the moment, not much. At the moment, when the cubs don't get any meat or not enough meat, they can always substitute their diet with milk that the mother will still produce for them. It's only when cubs really get to about nine months to a year old where they're fully weaned and they're, and they're eating meat, that competition for food around the kill becomes really tough for these young cubs. What happens is they need to start fighting, really, for their scraps at a kill. And male lions that come in and just dominate a kill don't leave really anything. They, don't, they hardly leave anything for females, let alone the cubs that are, are around about a year old. And quite often, teenage cubs, cubs that are from nine months to about one and a half years old, start looking very bedraggled, mangy, and they start looking quite skinny. And it's because they really have to just fight for scraps. Um, and leftovers and bits and pieces that they can steal. They won't physically be attacked at a, at a, at a kill. Um, even by the males, they won't physically be attacked, but they will be shunned and they will be out, out fought, basically. And that definitely leaves them a little bit hungrier than usual. But it's one of those things, it's one of the trials in the lion's life and that they'd get to. The good thing is that for now, all the cubs that we have here at Juma, that I know of at least anyway, are all less than nine months old. And, um, and so therefore they'll all be substituting their milk with moms. And these Birmingham boys, they hold a pretty big territory. And they won't always be within Kahumas. 
And that means that the ladies are going to hunt a lot of the times without the threat of males coming to steal their kills. And so a lot of the times they'll have enough food to make the milk that they need to give to their babies as well. So no worries there. All good. Ah, such a lovely day. I was just reminiscing yesterday. There's very few jobs on the face of the world that you get told to get out into the bush and have fun looking for animals and speaking to people. It is one of my favorites. Nice relaxing day. I'm absolutely curious, absolutely curious to know what's happening in Rwanda with the gorillas and Brent. I am dying to know. I know that there's obviously a problem, otherwise we would have been able to bring you some shows already from there. But nevertheless, there's obviously a good reason for it. We will get there eventually. It marks a very, very big step in our product. And it marks a big step in the fact that we are going to be, not for the first time, but we are going to be venturing out of the boundaries of Juma with the product. So carrying on here with the Safari Life project here, but also having satellite or mobile safari units that are capable of producing a show or an insert for a show from almost anywhere on the planet. And ambitious, yes, gorillas in a rainforest on the side of a mountain in a foreign country, absolutely. But then that is the hallmark of what we do here, is we push those boundaries and we have been pushing those boundaries for such a long time. So stay tuned, I think, is the message that I have for everybody over there, not just today, but in the days and the months and the years to come, you're going to see some, not that you haven't in the last couple of months, I must be honest, the growth has been phenomenal, but the velocity will keep on, I think, or the acceleration will keep on. I know I'm for one, very, very excited about it, what all's going on. So still keeping my head on a bit of a swivel here. Some old lion tracks up and down tracks of a male lion that's coming down this road but I think this was the male lion that we found yesterday morning definitely not the freshest and then around here let's see if we can spot the family of water thickney that live here there was on an occasion last season I found seven of them sleeping underneath there we go <laughs> okay, I can see at least three. So let's have a bit of a competition here with everybody. Let me get it, us into a position where we can see them. <laughs> Even Gert was like, I don't know where they are. Do you mean just tell me? <laughs> so let's see if this is a good place. There's one. There's another one. And then on the left hand side of the first one that we saw, inside there, I think it's probably behind the stump now, is the third one that I saw. That is a water thickney, a little colony of water thickneys. They've been here for at least a year. And goodness knows how long before that in terms of generation wise. Let's go forward a little bit more. I actually think the one that's lying down there is a juvenile. Let's use my binoculars to have a look. No, an adult. I know it's a water thickney and not a spotted thickney because of the distinct lack of spots on the back of the bird. 
as well as that bright white plumage that you can see across the eyebrow. Quite a large bird. I would say probably standing about as tall as a chicken. Although not really as robust as a chicken, not as round as a chicken is, with long skinny legs. Nocturnal birds, hence that very large eye that they have. And then quite a yellow eye as well. And they hunt for frogs and insects around water sources. That was a nice find, eh, Kat? All right, let's carry on going. All right, let's see if we can coax some forward momentum out of this car. So one, two, three. Only three. Like I said, last year was the record that I found underneath that bush was seven. Let's go. Now we got to try and make it up this hill. That's going to be the next challenge. So let's get some momentum built here. <laughs> Come on, girl. You can do it. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and I think that since it's probably going to take me the rest of the century to get back to the workshop in Opa, I think a good time now would be for me to say thank you very much for joining my safari. Thank you very much, Cad. Thank you for the ladies in FC for helping me along today. Thank you all for all your questions and your comments and for sharing this morning's adventure. It's been I don't know, for me a pretty weird day, it started off with a hope, much hope of lion, with those lion roaring, with a female and cubs in the area, but then of course I should never predict things like that, you should warn me before we start these mornings, never say what we're going to see, it always ends up being something else. But in any case, I'm looking forward to a very good day, we will see you again this afternoon, myself at least and Jamie, and wherever you are in the world, please have a good day, and we'll catch up later. Steph, go! I hope he manages to make it up that hill, or at least up the several hills that seem might lie between him and Opa, the mechanic that we all rely upon rather heavily to keep our vehicles in running order. Poor wounded Wendy's clutch just doesn't seem to be coming right. Well, hopefully Steph does make it back, otherwise we'll go and we'll rescue him and pull Wendy back to camp. I think uh, I, I've got a feeling it's touch and go at this point as to what it might be. Well, we've got a good starting point for Shadow. Her track's disappearing off into the drainage system that we were checking the area of. I have a feeling she's around there somewhere still, especially if those alarm calls that apparently were heard are anything to go by. A good place to start for our sunset safari, but as Steph says, never predict what you're going to see because there's a good chance that you won't see it. So this morning, not going according to plan, but then again, it would be very boring if it did. It would take the fun out of it completely. Now we're going to start wending our merry way home, and just an update in terms of the gorilla situation. The guys are trekking on their way to find them. We will keep you updated on Twitter. You know, of course, you all know, of course, that it is a pilot project. But we are very, very hopeful that things are going to work out. It's the first time we're just basically trying to see if this is going to work uh, for the future. But they are on their way to the gorillas as we speak. And we'll keep you in the loop in terms of what's happening there. I can tell you that I'm going to be sitting glued to the screens in final control during my middle of the day time period before the sunset drive. It's so exciting. And I'm looking forward to being regaled with by all sorts of tales 
of their adventures in the rainforest. I can imagine there's going to be some serious stories to tell. Speaking of serious stories to tell, here comes a vehicle full of people on their way back to camp for breakfast. Ellie's. Ah, yes. Let's dodge off here. Watch the elephants cross the road. How's it, guys? Bye bye, guys. Ellie's in the dust for our last few moments of the sunrise safari. Shame, guys. What's this one doing? What are you doing? The little elephant was on the ground when I first looked at it. It's back up again, digging for something. I'm not sure what that was about. Ah, oh, this is such a lovely herd. Oh, what a pity that we're almost at the end of our sunrise safari. Chandra, there's an elephant still on the ground. Sorry, I know we're watching them cross the road and it's awesome. But if you look to the left, there where the little one is basically now standing on it, there's an elephant lying down there. Look. <laughs> His legs waving in the air. Have you been having a lovely nap there in the sun on this cold winter's morning? Can you get up now? Come on. Oh, oh some days are just harder than others. That's exactly what I felt like this morning when I tried to get out of bed. <laughs> Come on, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> oh, Come on, come on, up, Ah, oh, maybe back to sleep. And unfortunately, we have reached the end of our sunrise safari. Come on, little one, up you get. And it's time for us to, yes, I know, this elephant looks like, uh, yes, this is, this is the average person on a Monday morning. Whoa, yay, and it's up. Oh, we better do our closing quickly. A big thank you to all of you for joining us. Jandre, thank you for your company and your camera work as always, as well as to Rebecca and to Lou and to Jerry and to all of the ladies in Final Control and Peter Bright for the technical stuff. Most importantly, thank you to all of you watching across the globe. We hope you stay tuned for the gorilla action and we'll catch you for the sunset safari. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great day.